so we had questions. Uh, we had a lot of questions, uh, and I think that was one of the things that we learned was uh, to be able to think critically about these things that um, for many of us in the group were raised Muslim and identify as Muslim. So kind of um, questioning these ideas that we take um, kind of face value on. So we had question. One of the main questions we had is how does the Imam himself practice Islam, like considering being a gay Muslim or being a queer identified Muslim, does he um, alter any of his practices? Also, we had questions about gender norms. And, it's, and it's, for me, that was one of the things that was hard to kind of separate with like LGBTQI uh, Muslim rights and gender norms largely. Really quickly, um, we have some questions and some ideas. Uh, the primary takeaway that we talked about was LGBTQ individuals are accepted in Islam based on all the historical examples that were provided, um, the specific conversations with the Prophet. Um, and then we also talked about the Hadith and then how it's a lot about context. So looking at uh, the historical aspect, but also the cultural and the, the language aspects as well. As far as the questions, we wanted to look at um, the way of life versus many different cultures. Um, do you guys remember what question that was? Um, so that was if there is, um, the, because culture is based, Oh right, this is yeah. her question. Yeah. Religion comes from culture, yeah. and there's so many different cultures. Um, uh, people, it's not a culture, basically. So how can then there be one way of life? Yeah. yeah. So I think Ms. was talking about how, you know, oftentimes we present Islam as a way of life. And so what does that mean when we're talking about specific groups of people who may feel like, you know, the, uh, uh, essentially what we're talking about is different countries have different aspects of religion. Uh, we talked about um, four things that we really learned from the presentation. The first being, um, we thought it was interesting, uh, the history of homosexuality and its relationship to Islam. Um, in relation to that, the mis misinterpretation of religious texts, so uh, with the hadith and not killing someone who prays, what does it mean to interpret a text if everybody's interpretation um, is their own? Um, and then we thought the relationship between homosexuality, politics, and Islam, um, and that coupled with post-colonialism and European politics was uh, really, really fascinating in what it means for the state of homosexuality and Islam today. Uh, we had two specific questions. Uh, the first is, does the current drive or trend against homosexuality derive from Wahhabism? Um, and we wanted to, we were interested in learning about possibly the Iranian experience with homosexuality. Um, and is the link between uh, politics and homosexuality inseparable since we all agreed that um, everything's political? So, yeah. Just one of the things that we um, <clears throat> especially appreciated was the history and linguistic roots of the, the, the terms being used and how these things all fit in. And we have a ton of more questions than other comments to make. Um, some are what are typical objections to inclusivity and what are useful ways to respond? Um, what um, strategies can be used for reaching the masses. What things do you, you know, have you used specifically as a gay imam in a society there? Um, how to help people who feel conflicted between, say, Islam and supporting LGBT family members and other um, folks, especially those who feel judgment from God and from the community, local community. How do we create a more inclusive culture through our daily actions, building bridges? And building an inclusive community that, that doesn't exclude or abandon the traditionalists. Because sometimes I feel like it's what we might need to do for our safety, but that's another question. Great. Our group talked a lot about um, uh, power dynamics and politics. And our first point that we decide from some of the things that we learned, but also personal experience all organized religion has been tainted by straight white males. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, uh, the chain of reporters can be inaccurate. Uh, some of the diagram you showed is really interesting to us. And lastly, the question we had, uh, how does MPV specifically uh, use the tools and resources that we learned about? One of the biggest things we talked about was just uh, how much context changes over time and how that impacts the way we understand different stories in the Quran and that sort of thing. Um, the story of Lot, that always sticks out, because this is one of the stories that everyone always references. Um, to kind of support themselves in hate, usually. Um, and then have the, the uh, no, no, the, the story regarding Ishtar. I think we, we had never heard the racialized aspect of it. Like, I've read about the, the rage, maybe, of angels and lack of hospitality, but I, I mean, I've never heard of the racialized rage part. Um, we 
We also thought it was very interesting that no lesbians were ever mentioned, positive or negative, that we could see. Um, and we highlighted the connection between colonialism and fascism, and then wondered if you would ever be able to expand more on the, the role of uh, economics in that. So whether or not an economic, oh, go ahead. Uh, whether or not in, um, <laughs> economic uh, instability kind of fuels fascism and, and so that people can internalize those different resources and kind of centralize them. And then okay. questions, of course. Awesome. Okay, so basically our, our uh, diagram is a little bit like a thought bubble thing. So uh, we talked about how Islamic thought is much more diverse than, than is originally portrayed and how Islamic scholarship is more than just the four imams. Um, we talked about uh, how you know, Islam uh, is, is more about faith and, and walking a certain path versus political agendas, power, and fascism. It's, you know, that's not really what Islam is about. That's how Islam is used. Um, how Islamic practice, uh, religious practice in general, comes, comes from culture and not vice versa. That was a surprising thing to learn. Um, uh, one of the questions, how are these ideas um, uh, perceived and... and um, how received in more conservative settings, like uh, here, I see this like a very safe space, but I imagine that in more conservative stages, so we were curious about that. And then we talk about like the importance of context, as, as, as you mentioned, that, uh, that yeah, we have to contextualize and not thinking that this is the same world as before, but there are dangers in doing this contextualization because uh, using terminology that it's like very rooted in Western civilization can be used like as a, as a weapon uh, in, in like new forms of Islam or more like political agendas of Islam. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is ours because um, we, we, we kind of have a rebel group. We didn't actually do the assignment. We just had fabulous conversation and we got to know each other. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We did talk a little bit about um, what is it like, let's say, to have um, kids in an interfaith marriage. Because um, we were both kind of in that situation, and we talked about how do you come up with a name for your child that really respects um, both parents' uh, traditions and heritages and things like that. So it was a lot of fun, and we have new friends. One of the, the main uh, topics that we came uh, away with is that the treatment of homosexuality is mis misrepresented in the Quran. Uh, the second one is that uh, fascism is something that crosses cultures, including Islam. And uh, the third one is that homosexuality is not directly referenced in the Quran. And specifically, we, we thought it was interesting that there were no lesbians mentioned in the book. Um, the question that we have is how is homosexuality, uh, uh, or how is the Muslim world uh, viewing or, or changing its view of homosexuality as we're going forward. And are, are Muslims more accepting of homosexuality outside of the Muslim culture uh, than they are inside the, the, the Muslim culture is a, a question that we have. And also someone wanted to know what, um, what standards should inform the fic going forward? Great question. How do I practice? Starting with a very personal um, question. I practice what is good for me. <laughs> That's it. If I go to uh, a church with some friends and I have to sit on a bench instead of bending over and, and so, I, I can do it. Closing my eyes and meditating, it's only tools. And, and the Quran is mainly about uh, stories. There's a beautiful verse in the Quran saying Surah Yusuf alayhi salam نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ القصص. We are telling you the most beautiful stories. So that's what my grandmother transmitted to me. She was a Sufi, a lot of meditation and so on. And that's what after a lot of tribulations and trials and so on, I got back to. The roots. What is good for us, this is halal. What is bad for us, this is haram. It's not about fascism and putting people in boxes. It's about emancipation and love and universalism. And that's also linked to another question about how could we produce different um, representations of religion in different cultures, even within Islam, different culture, uh, cultural uh, colors. Yes, but that's humanity. You like it or not, we like it or not, we just have to accompany it and accept it. Because God says in the Quran, also, uh, uh, Azza wa Jal, 
We created you tribes and nations so we got to learn one another and got to learn about yourself. So diversity of cultures, of gender, and so on, it's what I said about, you know, those verses are in the Quran to promote diversity, never to, to my knowledge, to, to, you know, to kill it. Gender norms in progressive Islam. There's no gender norm in progressive Islam or in Islam uh, per se. If you go to Mecca, they used to, before Islam, they used to turn around the black stone, you know, in Ka the Kaaba, naked, men and women. And then Islam came to say, no, you, maybe you should dress up. <laughs> That's it. But they, I mean, uh, I've been to Mecca five times since 2003, I think. And I've seen the change in, in Wahhabi representation that they're coming back from, also in Saudi Arabia, with the new king, and I think might not be perfect politically, economically. But they are understanding that they maybe have, have gone so far. They're building, you know, last time I came to, there to my, with my mother, they started pulling her, almost pitting her, because they said, you don't have to pray next to the Kaaba, you have to be in the back because you're a woman. I've never seen that before, and to my knowledge, that was never the, the authentic Islamic tradition. We always doing the, always uh, did the tawaf, men and women, and transgender, and gays, and straight, all together, without any distinction. That's the pillar of Islam, the tawheed, the university of our the ummah, of our community. So how could you start separating between men and women so strictly? You know, and, and tawaf around the Kaaba is supposed to be thousands of times more powerful, and it is, mm -hmm. than... Uh, yeah, it's beautiful and also so hard to see that, uh, yeah, our heritage is sometimes misused. Anyway, no kill who, those who pray and anyone else, those who kill uh, that, the, the one who kills one is the one, uh, like the one who killed the entire humanity, says the Quran. Shia Islam. Hard to compare because they, they pay social security in Iran and Spain. And Iran is not the only Shia tradition, but in Iran they pay for transgender operation, tra uh, gender transition, sexual transi transsexual uh, transition. But then they consider that homosexuality is kufr. It's like you are a uh, kafir, you are non-Muslim. Because it's coming from a misunderstanding of one tra tradition coming from Ali radiallahu anhu. So that's also a misunderstanding. But the tradition coming from Ali, to my knowledge, is not saying that you should kill homosexuals. Ali, when they did that uh, shura, that concert with Abu Bakr, said you should kill that guy for jihad. And then they took it from here, you know, one misunderstanding after another and so on, like we call it in Arabic, Arab telephone. I whisper something to your ear, you whisper it, and in the end, it would be something completely different, if not opposite to what I, said, I, I told you. What do you use for trainings? You know, we have manuals that we, it took us years to do. They're not perfect, but we're transmitting them to anyone who is interested and willing to, to do what we are doing for the same purposes. So uh, material is here, not perfect and need to be enhanced, but it's here. Building inclusive communities with it in 2012, thanks to MPV in France, in Paris. Uh, the community after I left a few years after, not because of me, but it was a bit shaking, but now it's restarting. They still want to, to do inclusive prayers and so on. So that's not perfect. That's not the only way to do it, but it's a great tool to do it. Inclusive mosque, inclusive communities. Economic and misery, yes, yes. It's becoming hard to say, but misery, uh, unemployment, non-education, people starving, that's the best recipe for fascism and violence. And then we have a concept in sociology saying, called hysteresis, hysteresis. It's not hysteria, it's hysteresis. It's a chemical process that we use also in sociology, meaning that once something, some factor, has been part of a given culture for so long, even if you take the main determining factor, the cause, the process will still go on. So now violence, unfortunately, has become part of Arab Muslim societies, and we have to put so much effort now to withdraw it. It's not going to disappear just like this. And the main determining factor for me, it's not the culture, the religion, it's just a facade. Just a facade. It's misery. When people are happy, they're not starting just like that to kill one another. Unless they're crazy, that's something else. How is it changing in Islam? Slowly but surely. There's even inclusive communities in Tunisia. How comes? Tunisia, they have their Sidiqi, secular, very, very progressive uh, uh, high schools everywhere in the country since the 19th century. So education. They have uh, uh, no war for petrol. Second factor, money, economics. 
they have no canal de Suez, they have no Israel-Palestine conflict, they have no, and so on and so forth. So if people are dying, starving under the bombs for decades, yeah, some of them are turn, turning crazy and they start killing one another and other people. But that's not Islam, that's not the Arab culture. And if MPV is using any kind of tools to do that kind of things, I'll let you answer. Yes. Um, so I, like you said, we have the we have very inclusive um, prayer spaces. Uh, we have chapters all across the state. So DC does have an inclusive prayer space with their chapter. In LA, we don't have an actual space because everything's very expensive in LA. But um, we do at, at people's homes, we have inclusive iftars and people can pray there. Um, I know Atlanta also has a space. We have places in Chicago. Um, and then we do stuff like this. We put on workshops and uh, try to put out a lot of educational materials. Um, so I don't know if that will necessarily convince those people totally on the right that don't want to be convinced, but at least it speaks to those that, that need it the most. And I think that's what's most, most important for me personally and what I do with MPV is helping those that need to hear this and that don't know what Islam inherently says. So those are our, our avenues as of right now. We are also just a two-person team. There's only two of us that work full-time um, and runs the whole thing, so it's very hard to do it all, but um, we manage with what we can. So if those are our ways as of now. If you have any ideas, let me know. If you want to help, definitely let me know. <laughs> and back to you. Is that the last question? That's it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. For